Whenever we have a property transaction, the first place to go in tax is always to calculate the realized gain or loss, the gateway provision. Amount realized minus adjusted basis gives us realized gain or loss. What exactly is amount realized? Well, that's what this video is going to discuss. Amount realized in common terms deals with what actually am I getting as a result of the transaction? What do I get? Now, the first thing that goes into the amount realized is actual cash received. So if a taxpayer receives cash as a result of a property transaction, the amount of cash received goes into the taxpayer's amount realized. Next is constructive cash received. Now this one is a little bit more of a fuzzy concept. You're thinking, what exactly do you mean constructive cash? It really has to do with liability relief. And let me explain why it matters. Let's say we have two taxpayers. Taxpayer one and taxpayer two. Taxpayer one is going to sell to taxpayer two a house worth $600,000, which has a $100,000 mortgage attached to it. Taxpayer two is gonna pay $500,000 cash to taxpayer one. If you're looking at this, it makes sense. The net equity in the house, which is worth $600,000 minus $100,000 mortgage is $500,000. So we're concerned with calculating the amount realized for taxpayer one. So taxpayer one receives $500,000 cash from taxpayer two. So actual cash received is $500,000. Next we ask, is there any constructive cash? Well, this is where liability relief comes into play. Liability relief is viewed as constructive cash because it's as if taxpayer two gives taxpayer one an additional $100,000 cash and taxpayer one then pays off the $100,000 mortgage and the mortgage is no longer there. So this will be an additional $100,000 of cash and that term is called constructive cash. So again, the idea is that they are taking on the liability it's as if the other party is being relieved because they no longer have any attachment with respect to that liability. When it comes to tax law, there's no distinction in the amount realized whether the liability is being assumed or taken subject to. Assume just means that taxpayer two would be the party on the actual $100,000 mortgage. Take subject to means taxpayer one is on the mortgage, still named on the mortgage, but taxpayer two continues to pay. So if taxpayer two, two does not pay anymore and defaults, then the bank will come after taxpayer one, but taxpayer one can still go after taxpayer two. Now this rule also applies regardless of the liability is recourse or non-recourse in nature. And this has been through the Crane and Tufts decisions, both Supreme Court level decisions in tax law. Recourse liability means the borrower is personally liable beyond just the amount at risk or the actual investment. Non-recourse, the borrower is not personally liable. It's just the amount of the investment or the secured collateral whatever it is. So if you have this $100,000 mortgage on a house and it's non-recourse, which non-recourse liabilities these days are very rare, if you have $100,000 non-recourse liability, you would almost surely have some type of asset collateral attached to that and that would probably be the actual house. So if the party did not make any more payments on the non-recourse liability, the bank could not go after the party, but they could seize the house they can sell the house and take what they are owed and then give the rest to the party. Recourse in that case, if someone stopped paying the liability, the bank can go after the actual personal assets, not just the investment or whatever it is. So that's constructive cash. That's a huge concept when it comes to amount realized. Now the next is the fair market value of non-cash property received. You might be thinking, okay, I know exactly what that is. It's whatever the, the willing buyer and willing seller said it, and that's exactly what the tax law defines. Whatever the willing buyer and willing seller agree to that. But what if it's very hard to determine the fair market value and the parties don't agree? Well, there was a case known as Philadelphia Park and Amusement. Philadelphia Park and Amusement Company. We'll just say Philadelphia Park and Amusement. And this is the most relied upon case when it comes to this concept. If you can't determine the fair market value of a specific item, 
and you're trying to calculate the amount realized, look at the other side. If the parties are unrelated, so if we have taxpayer one and taxpayer two, and you're looking at both their amount realized, both their amount realized should be equal. Their amount realized should equal. So if you're able to determine the amount realized of one party, it should equal the other party as well if the parties are unrelated. Related being if you're family members, corporation, the shareholder, employee, employer. But if you're unrelated parties, then they should equal. The amount realized should equal. So that's one important thing. So if you know the fair market value of the non-cash property received, then you include that. But if you don't, use the Philadelphia Park and Amusement concept to calculate what that amount realized should be if you know the other side's amount realized, what the value of the property given up is. So for example, if we didn't know the value of this house, but we knew the mortgage is $100,000 and we knew that there's $500,000 of cash being provided, we can use the Philadelphia Park and Amusement to make the amount realized for party two also equal to $600,000. And again, that's assuming they're unrelated. So the last item that goes into amount realized is selling expense. So selling expense includes various items such as if you're selling the house, right? Taxpayer one selling a house and taxpayer one incurs various legal fees and setting up the contract or realtor fees or various items to actually sell the asset to get it sold. Those are going to be subtracted. That's the only one subtracted. So these are subtracted away to calculate amount realized. So these are the items that go into amount realized.